Hi, I'm Ryan Levy. Welcome to Cyberism's Malicious Life. To say that Sven Olaf Kemphaus is an eccentric character would be an understatement. In his Stack Exchange profile, he describes himself as, quote, His Royal Highness Prince Sven Olaf, hacker of all frequencies, God Emperor of Amsterdam. Former associates who worked with him in his native country, the Netherlands, describe him as a brilliant programmer, but also as a loner. Who has trouble connecting with others around him. For example, one colleague recalls that as a help desk representative for the Dutch ISP Access for All, Sven would often confuse customers. Quote, he was very smart. Too smart for customers, by the way. Oftentimes, they couldn't understand his techno babble when he tried to help them. End quote. In 1996, Sven started a company called CB3Rob that did security checks for other organizations. One such client was a web hosting company called Cyberbunker, which is how Sven met yet another eccentric Dutchman, Hermann Johan Zent. The two men were quite different in both their physical appearance and motivations. Sven was a slender 20-something youth with a thick pair of eyebrows and a deep, penetrating look, while Zent was already in his late 30s and sported what some commentators described as a James Bond villain look, with pale white skin and long, wavy blonde hair. Sven described himself as an internet freedom fighter along the lines of Julian Assange of Wikileaks, while Zent was more of a businessman. He started his journey in the tech world as a dealer in computer parts and later established a few web hosting companies. What brought these two very different types together was probably their shared hatred towards authority. Sven had a rich history of tackles with his managers who constantly reprimanded him for hacking Access for All's computer systems. Zent's latest web hosting business, Cyberbunker, promised its clients full protection from quote-unquote government meddling. Their unlikely partnership coalesced around the unusual building that gave Zent's company its name. The bunker was built by NATO in 1955 at the height of the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union. Nuclear war between the two superpowers seemed like a real possibility, and so the military complex, erected near the small town of Klotinge in the south of the Netherlands, was designed to survive a close-by nuclear blast of up to 20 megatons of TNT. Its five subterranean levels, enclosed over 20,000 square feet, protected by 15 feet thick concrete walls, and designed to shelter up to 72 people for over 10 years. It had water reserves, a pair of diesel-powered electricity generators, a meeting room with a 15 feet long black table facing a huge screen, an industrial class kitchen, and even a sauna. Because... Well, why not? In 1996, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, NATO decided to decommission the bunker and sell it off. Johann Zent jumped on the opportunity and purchased the facility. It's not hard to guess the reasons behind the unusual purchase. One of the most important considerations when choosing a location for any data center is reliability. A hosting service can have thousands of customers for whom the availability of their online services is often of paramount importance. 
That is part of the reason why most cloud providers have multiple facilities spread across different geographical locations, so that if a natural disaster, flood, fire, earthquake, whatever, hits one facility, the rest will continue to operate as normal and shoulder the load of the battered server farm. Zent didn't have the resources to offer such redundancy to his clients, but the old bunker offered a fantastic alternative. The fact that it was built to withstand a nuclear attack meant that it was also invulnerable to almost anything Mother Nature could throw at it. From a pure business perspective, this was a strong selling point that Zent made sure to emphasize in CyberBunker's client-facing website by highlighting numerous pictures of the bunker's robust gray walls and impressive specifications. For Sven Camphouse, the bunker had yet another enticing attribute. The following quote is taken from an interview he gave to Heavy.com. Quote, Well, basically, it is a NATO base. Basically, the building was sold in 1996 and it was never made into Dutch territory. We tried to make it Dutch territory at first, but we realized we do not actually need you people. End quote. It's unclear if the former NATO bunker was indeed an independent territory exempt from the jurisdiction of Dutch law, but Sven, for whom freedom from censorship and any sort of governmental interference was a powerful ideal, was more than willing to put this hypothesis to the test. He even appointed himself as, quote, Minister of Telecommunications and Foreign Affairs for the Republic of Cyberbunker, end quote. And so the two renegade Dutchmen decided to team up, with Zent running the business side of Cyberbunker and Sven providing the technical expertise. They made Cyberbunker into a bulletproof hosting service, pledging that, quote, Cyberbunker will keep your servers online no matter what. Cyberbunker will protect your servers from hurricanes, earthquakes, crashing airplanes, nuclear bombs, floods, and anything else that could interrupt the hosting of your servers. In addition, Cyberbunker protects your servers also from others who might want to take your servers down, like the DMCA, your competitors, authorities, burglars, governments, and terrorists. End quote. Cyberbunker's first customers were mostly porn websites. This did not present a problem to the Dutch authorities, since the Netherlands is known for its liberal attitudes. Over time, though, these were joined by a growing number of less legitimate clients, spammers, scammers, drug dealers, and similar shady characters who found Cyberbunker's hardline anti-authoritarian attitude appealing. Much of this activity was probably considered illegal in the Netherlands, but it seems that both the local and governmental authorities were unaware at that point of what was going on behind the nuclear bunker's thick walls. But in 2002, the local fire brigade received an urgent call. Smoke was billowing out of the underground bunker. The firemen rushed to the scene and quickly put out the fire. Zent suffered burns to his hands and face. It soon turned out that these wounds were the lesser of Zent's problems. Subsequent investigation of the incident discovered that the fire broke out due to an explosion in an illegal ecstasy manufacturing lab hidden deep in one of the bunker's lower levels. Three men and one woman were arrested for running the illicit manufacturing facility and were later sentenced to three years in prison. Zent himself, though he was the actual owner of the building, managed to distance himself from the affair, claiming that he rented the place to what he thought was a painting manufacturing company and that he was unaware of the unlawful activity that was going on in the lab. Zent and Sven were off the hook, but the unfortunate incident turned out to be an eye-opener for the Klottinger City Council, who for the first time took real interest in what was going on inside the old bunker. 
It didn't take the council long to realize that Cyberbunker was operating an online crime hub right underneath their noses. They decided not to wait for a full official investigation into Cyberbunker's criminal activities and do whatever was in their power to drive the rogue company out of their peaceful town. According to Cyberbunker's website, a few months after the fire, a city official appeared one day at the gate of the bunker and asked to be taken on a tour of the facility. The official was quote-unquote surprised to discover that the building was used as a data center and declared that Cyberbunker was in violation of the city's zoning regulations. Apparently, the bunker was designated as a military zone, and web hosting had nothing to do with military activity. Cyberbunker's representative retorted that the mayor himself has approved the purchase of the bunker and its transformation to a data center, and that he has a letter from the mayor to prove it. The city official, who was most probably well aware of that fact, insisted that Cyberbunker was violating zoning laws and must cease its operations. Cyberbunker declined the demand and submitted an official request for a zoning change. The request was, as expected, denied. The city council sent two more representatives to threaten Cyberbunker, but Zent and Sven ignored them. The city then decided to sue the company for the supposed zoning violation, and in particular for operating an electric motor with a power draw in excess of 1.5 kilowatts of energy without a valid permit, motors used for air treatment of the facility. The judge, however, ruled in favor of Cyberbunker. This regulatory cat-and-mouse game went on for quite some time, until the city council apparently had enough. One day in 2007, the council's chairman himself appeared in front of the bunker's entrance and demanded to be let in. According to Cyberbunker's description in its website, the chairman's phone call was received by the bunker's general manager, a man by the name of Jordan Robson, who, based on his pictures, probably had a successful career as an international model before joining the rogue hosting company. It's more than likely that this Jordan Robson was none other than Johann Zent himself, hiding behind a fictitious persona. Zent slash Robson notified the chairman that he will not be granted access to the bunker, and the chairman replied that he is accompanied by the police and fire brigade and will enter the building by force if necessary. This, apparently, was the moment that Zent and Sven were waiting for. The first real opportunity to put their bunker to the test. Zent reminded the chairman that the building was designed to survive a nuclear strike, wished the chairman success in his endeavor, and hung up the phone. Four hours later, when Zent arrived at the bunker, he found the chairman and the fire brigade's officers standing in front of the building's massive blast doors. Apparently, the firemen had tried to cut the doors open with hydraulic equipment normally used to shear cars involved in crashes, but all they managed to do was to damage the door's mechanism to the point where it was jammed and could not be opened at all. According to Zent, the humiliated chairman left the place with his men and was later forced to compensate Cyberbunker for the damage done to the blast doors. A few months later, the bunker had yet another opportunity to prove its usefulness. At dawn, a full SWAT team, wearing black bulletproof vests and carrying automatic weapons and round metal shields, silently cut through the wire fence that surrounded Cyberbunker's facility and approached its front door. Once there, the soldiers pulled out a battering ram and tried to knock down the blast doors. One can only imagine the noise and commotion caused by the battering, 
But not only did the heavy doors hold their ground, the people deep inside the bunker, some of whom were watching a movie, never even noticed what was happening outside. Even when the SWAT team threw flashbang grenades to try and get their attention, no one in the bunker heard anything. The embarrassed SWAT team, like the council's chairman before them, were forced to leave the building the way they came. Zent only learned of the whole incident later that evening, when he noticed the marks left on the doors by the battering ram and checked the video recordings taken by the bunker's surveillance system. The somewhat bizarre clashes with the Klottinger City Council proved to be a fantastic PR opportunity for Cyberbunker. Although most of the boasts on the company's websites regarding the bunker's toughness were focused on its resilience against natural disasters, there was also a subtle but clear intimation that the bunker would also allow Cyberbunker to physically resist any attempts by law enforcement to forcibly break into the data center as part of the company's pledge to keep its clients' web pages online no matter what. Failed bids to break into the bunker, such as the city council's chairman and SWAT team attempts, served as proof that Cyberbunker can and will resist any such future attempts, which is exactly what its potential clients wanted to hear. No wonder that Cyberbunker made sure to give detailed accounts of the failed breaking attempts on its website. The best strategy for organizations to avoid becoming a victim of ransomware is to prevent the attack from being successful in the first place. Cyber Reason remains undefeated in the fight against ransomware because it moved beyond alerting to deliver an operation-centric approach that detects and prevents ransomware attacks at the earliest stages of initial ingress and lateral movement. The Cyber Reason predictive response capability disrupts ransomware attacks prior to data exfiltration and long before the ransomware payload can be delivered. Visit cyberreason.com to learn more about predictive ransomware protection and how your organization can realize both increased efficiency and efficacy through an operation-centric approach to security operations. the company's next big PR opportunity cropped up in 2009. The Pirate Bay, the world's most famous index of BitTorrent files, was facing fierce opposition on multiple fronts. Some of its members were convicted of assistance to copyright infringement and given jail time, while the website itself suffered recurring downtime due to the legal pressures exerted on its upstream providers. Zent and Sven seized the opportunity and offered the Pirate Bay its No Questions Asked hosting services, and the Pirate Bay's change of address from Sweden to the Netherlands grabbed the media attention with sensational headlines such as The Pirate Bay Relocates to a Nuclear Bunker. The Motion Pictures Association quickly moved to sue Cyberbunker, and a year later, a district court ruled against the bulletproof hosting service. The Pirate Bay relocated back to a Swedish hosting service, but Cyberbunker already earned its 15 minutes of international fame. Cyberbunker also served as a mirror for WikiLeaks, further enhancing its reputation as a company willing to go the extra mile to protect its clients, shady and problematic as they might be. But not all attention is necessarily good attention. Cyberbunker's new notoriety drew the attention of the Spam House Project, an international organization founded in 1998 to battle email spammers, botnet controllers, and the like. According to reporting by the journalist and blogger Brian Krebs, Spam House was already familiar with Cyberbunker, but the Dutch bulletproof hosting company wasn't a top priority for the organization until, quote, 
when they started hosting botnet controllers, malware droppers, and a lot of pharma spam stuff. End quote. This noticeable rise in criminal activity, perhaps due to Cyberbunker's newly found fame, prompted Spamhouse to take action. A member of Spamhouse told Krebs that when they tried to contact Cyberbunker, they got a rude reply. From the content of the conversation, it's easy to guess that it was Sven Kemphaus who answered Spamhouse's inquiries. Quote, he made claims about being his own independent country in the Republic of Cyberbunker and said he was not bound by any laws and whatnot. He would also sign his emails Prince of Cyberbunker Republic. End quote. In October 2011, Spamhouse contacted Cyberbunker's upstream bandwidth provider, a Dutch company named A2B, and asked it to stop providing its services to Cyberbunker. A2B refused and blocked only a single IP address from Cyberbunker's range of addresses. This was a mistake. Spamhouse does not block or otherwise stop spammers by itself. It only maintains lists of known spammers and scammers, but these lists are used in turn by many internet service providers and email servers to block such nefarious activities at their source. This fact gives Spamhouse enormous leverage. If Spamhouse declares a range of IP addresses to be the source of spam and other criminal activities, the ISPs that make use of its lists will block all emails coming from these addresses, both spam and legitimate messages, a risk no ISP can afford to take. Which is exactly what happened to A2B's network when Spamhouse added A2B's range of 2048 IP addresses to its list of addresses that are known sources of email spam. A2B's executives were furious, accusing Spamhouse of extortion and even filed a police complaint against the anti spam organization. But Spamhouse was hardly impressed, dismissing A2B's claims as rubbish. Ever since its founding, the hard-nosed organization has been battling the Internet's worst scums and crooks, and faced numerous lawsuits and harassments of every kind. Only a year earlier, the fearless organization added IP addresses belonging to none other than mighty Google to its list of banned addresses when crooks began using its docs service to spread spam. So one can see why a police complaint by a tiny Dutch ISP wasn't all that intimidating for them. A2B had no other choice but to capitulate and remove Cyberbunker from its list of clients. Cyberbunker itself, however, refused to take the hint. It moved to a new upstream provider and continued to host spammers, scammers, and botnet operators. And so, in March of 2013, Spamhouse added it to its blacklist, effectively blocking all emails coming out of Cyberbunker's network. But unlike A2B's executives, Sven and Zant had no intention of caving in so easily to Spamhouse's demands. They had plenty of friends in the online underworld, many of whom already had some beef with the anti-spam organization. And together they formed a loose coalition of bulletproof hosters calling itself Stophouse, with Sven as its unofficial spokesperson. Stophouse's members got together and hatched a plan to force Spamhouse to not only remove Cyberbunker from its blacklists, but to ultimately destroy the anti-spam organization. It would not be an easy undertaking for sure, but Zent, Sven and their buddies were willing to go all the way to get what they wanted. In fact, they were willing to break the internet to make it happen 
by orchestrating the largest DDoS attack the world has ever seen. That's it for this episode. Tune in next week for part two of Cyberbunker's Bizarre Story. This week we're saying goodbye to Hadas Drucker, who ran our social media accounts and even helped with the sound design occasionally. Hadas is leaving us to follow her dream to become a graphic designer. Good luck, Hadas, from me and all the rest of the team here in PI Media. It was a joy working with you for the past two and a half years. I, however, am not going anywhere, and so you're stuck with my funny accent. Malicious Life is produced by PI Media. This episode was written and produced by me and edited by the illustrious Nate Nelson. Our website is malicious.life, and you can follow us on Twitter at at maliciouslife or follow me at at ranlevy. That's R-A-N-L-E-V-I. If you saw lots of activity around my Twitter feed in the past two weeks, mostly in Hebrew, and was wondering what all the commotion was about, that's because I got to interview Israel's newly re-elected Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, the first time that an Israeli Prime Minister gave an interview for a local podcast. I think he was interviewed for an American podcast a while back. Netanyahu is somewhat of a controversial figure in Israel, hence the racket and clamor in the feed. It was an interesting experience, to put it mildly. Thanks to CyberReason for underwriting the podcast. Learn more at cyberreason.com. Bye-bye.